Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Richard Ayub, Executive Director of Project Angel Food. Richard has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Richard, for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here, Mark. So Project Angel Food is about, is about food, it's about food security, but it's about so much more. Talk about the mission of Project Angel Food and also the other programs and impacts that you have for the community. So Project Angel Food was founded in 1989 in response to the AIDS crisis by someone you might remember her name, Mary Ann Williamson. Yes. She's running for president. In 1989, she saw that friends and family were dying of AIDS. And she wondered, how are they getting food? And how are they being taken care of? So she found a church at the corner of Fountain and Fairfax in Los Angeles. And she set up a kitchen there. And it was 100% volunteers. People were cooking food and delivering food to people dying of AIDS. And let's, let, let's remember what that was like at that time. Very often, whole communities were stricken. Uh, people were trying to take care of their friends and loved ones, but they were also uh, passing away. Uh, people were left isolated. They had no means. Uh, the community uh, attempted to respond, but there was no organized response. So Project Angel Food was so vitally important just for the day-to-day -day survival of people who were living it, uh, with AIDS and also living in fear. And also, we need to remember in those days, we didn't know how you could contract AIDS. If you touch someone with AIDS, would you get it? People were wearing surgical masks. People really didn't touch people with AIDS because they didn't want to catch it. And um, Marianne said, these are human beings and they need to be treated as human beings. And there were a lot of very brave, loving people who stepped forward and said, we want to help. And so in those early days, the meals were just comfort meals. There were mashed potatoes and turkey meatloaf and things like that. And what happened eventually is people were living with HIV. And so what we realized is if you started giving people healthy, nutritious meals, people with HIV, their viral load would go down. So there was a deep science to what we do. And so once HIV also became a little more controllable, we said, this is too great of a gift to just keep with this community. We've got to share it with everyone in Los Angeles who is sick, hungry, and alone. That's why we say food is medicine, because it is. Food can help you heal, it can help you live longer, and it can improve your quality of life. Uh, let me tell you about a new program we have. It's a program with the state of California. They are reimbursing us for meals with people on Medicaid who have congestive heart failure. They're the highest utilizers of the healthcare system. So people on, on Medicaid who have congestive heart failure. And the issue there is that when people are suffering from a heart condition, they require the use of medical services since they're on Medicaid. We're talking about state funding, which means that there's a huge amount of resource that is going to treatment of people. And, and if, if you can improve their health and reduce the treatment, you also reduce the amount of allocated funds. It's a very complicated argument, but, but we have a bucket of Medicaid funding. And if we're using it for one purpose, then it can't be used for another. Exactly. So, so this is about, it's not only about human health, it also connects to the practical use of very constrained resources. And it's saving taxpayers money because what happens is people with congestive heart failure can only have two grams of salt a day. Mm -hmm. If you get a can of Campbell's soup, that Campbell's soup has two grams of salt in it. That's all you could have for the, the rest of the day. day. Now, what you probably don't know, and I didn't know until I started doing some research, is that a stalk of celery has 32 milligrams of salt in it, naturally. 
So when a doctor tells a patient, go on a so, low salt diet, what does that really mean? How do we know what a low salt diet is? And the choice of ingredients, it actually determines where your salt intake is. Absolutely. And if these people are on Medicaid, that means they need financial aid because they're on Medicaid. And so they don't have a lot of money. So they will be buying fast food instead of going to Whole Foods or to Trader Joe's or to a supermarket where they can get, you know, uh, better foods. So this program gives them all of the nutrition they need. And if people stick to the program, their salt intake goes down. And if your salt intake goes down, your readmissions into hospital goes down. And what I think is more important is their quality of life improves. So you end up, it, it, this is so interesting. You have a, a, a complete cycle. You're collecting evidence. You're then saying, okay, subject to that evidence, because of that evidence, and because of a view of food as being medicine, you, are, you can shift diet, which is very cheap to do in, in comparison to buying pharmaceuticals. You can, sh you can shift diet because people have to eat anyway so that you're doing less harm to the body, causing a lower incidence of adverse effects, less use, utilization of hospitals, and a better allocation of resource, all at the same time. And it's a very slight adjustment. It's a, it's a low cost adjustment with huge impacts. And it's also changing the way you think. Uh, the healthcare system, hospitals, health clinics, don't naturally think of nutrition as part of their treatment. But I foresee a day where doctors won't only just write prescriptions for medicine, they'll also write prescriptions for food because food is medicine. So we want to get it integrated in hospitals and health clinics and have them figure out how nutrition helps with the, new, with the uh, post-hospital treatment. You're also affecting the commercial sector uh, for food because if you're not buying certain ingredients and certain foodstuffs because of their adverse impact on health, let's take the Campbell Soup example, if you stop buying any of those, those canned soups, there are two possibilities. Campbell's can forgo the market uh, of people who have health conditions, which is a huge market. We have an aging population. Or they can adjust their ingredients. So now you're talking about improving the nutritional content of, of our food chain, which is going to be helpful across the board. Well, you're already seeing food with lower salt content. You're seeing the food industry reacting to, you're right, the population aging and the population wanting healthier choices. So let's talk a little bit about how the organization functions. What is your budget? Our budget this year is $6.3 million. And in terms of the, the number of staff and volunteers? So we have about 40 full-time staff members and nearly 5,000 volunteers who come through our doors every year. So very highly leveraged. You have four, so you have 40 uh, staff members and how many volunteers? Uh, nearly 5,000. Nearly 5,000. And just so everyone knows, most of the volunteers work in our kitchen. 80% of our kitchen, six days a week, is driven by volunteers. And then you have quite a logistics operation going forward because food is perishable. It has to reach its destination within a certain time frame. Talk about that. So what we do is we flash freeze the food. And this is a process that packs on the nutrients, flavor, and aroma in these meals without any preservatives. And each meal is good for five weeks from today. And so we actually have this big freezer over there at Project Angel Food that houses about 11,000 meals at a time, and we cycle through them. The oldest go first. Nothing is there for more than a week, a week and a half, but we're, we have it just in case we have to shut down the kitchen for a day or there's some emergency. We don't want our clients to go unfed. 
So you're manufacturing an assembly plant for nutritional packets. Um, you have actual workflows. You have uh, process control. You have quality control. You have testing to make sure that uh, the food is not contaminated and, the, and that you meet health, uh, health guidelines. You are functioning as a manufacturing entity in part. Yes, when you put it that way, it sounds bureaucratic and it sounds impersonal, but having the volunteers in there, what you see is that volunteers lovingly put the scoop of, of corn in one tray and then the protein in another, and every meal is packed one at a time, and we have done that process 12 million times. That's, a, a, that's an amazing story because what, what you point out is so important, right? You have to have the highest standards. You're, you're talking about food manufacturing. We've all seen the recalls of packaged foods uh, in the supermarkets, and you have to adhere to all of those health standards. But that meditation, the meditation of individually knowing that that scoop has got to be it is going to be consumed by somebody. It's the, the, the content of that scoop has got to be uh, healthy. And what you're doing with your day is you're, you're transferring your energy into somebody else's health. That meditation is so important to the workflow that you have and what, what really makes you special. And we thank you for saying that. We have had people who have prayed over meals as they package them. Everyone has their own, you know, experience. Some will scoop it, but there is no way for you not to think about the individual getting that meal when you're in that process. I like to call the kitchen a great equalizer because whether you're there, I'm there, Charlie Sheen, a corporate executive, someone from a recovery program, or a high school kid, everyone is treated the same. A chef sees a body and says, okay, Mark, you're cutting onions today, and Richard, you're peeling potatoes, because that's where I need a body. And how many meals are served annually? We serve about 650,000 meals a year. And uh, my understanding is 12 million meals to more than 20,000 people. More than 20,000 since we've uh, started. And what's special about this program, one of the many things, is that when you sign on for the program, you sign on for a year. We go through the vetting process. Do you have mobility issues? Do you have a need for this food? Can you go to a food bank? If you can't, okay. Can you shop and cook for yourself? If you can't, okay then you qualify for our program. Do you have an illness where food will actually help? So we qualify you for the program, and we say, okay, you can be on it for a year. And I just got an email today from someone who has cancer and was in chemotherapy and radiation. And he emailed saying, I'm feeling better. I don't need your meals anymore. Uh, please give them to someone else who's sick. Now that is our favorite email, our favorite phone call. It is such a wonderful story. It is such a, such a wonderful application of different competencies, historical knowledge and, and current practice. Thank you so much for sharing the work of this amazing organization and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you for shining a light on us. We appreciate it. Oh, uh, it's, it's a light that's well-deserved. Thank you.